Our next speaker is Monique Bosch. Uh, Monique has built over 30 edible school and community gardens and farms around the Northeast, including a two-acre farm, er, two urban farm in Bridgeport, Connecticut. These days, she works as a soil health program manager for CT NOFA and runs a worm composting business with her son, Justin. She also teaches soil management for Brooklyn Botanic Garden. And this past year, Monique has worked with the staff and the students at Bard College at Simons Rock in the Berkshires to launch a food and resilience center. She studied the soil food web under Dr. Elaine Ingram and teaches my microscopy, soil health, and composting to farmers and organizations. Through microscopy and test trials, Monique explores the relationship between living soil and healthy, nutritious food. So we asked her here today to talk about compost extract and compost teas because we've gotten lots and lots of questions about that and I don't know the answer, so hopefully she does. <laughs> so that's Pressure's on. Give her a good job. Thank you. All right, so the pressure's on. Um, I'd like to know, has anyone done compost tea brewing in the past? Excellent, nice. Okay, so you, you just want to make sure you're doing it right. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, and why do it? I think it is probably, from what I'm learning, the most important thing we can do in terms of helping bring the soil back to life and grow nutritious food. So this is why I'm so passionate about it. I've done test trials, which I've got a few to show you, and I just keep talking about it and, and spreading the, the information because some people go, that sounds really gross. I don't want to know. Not that worms aren't gross, uh, <laughs> but um, I have a worm composting business, and then I look at it under the microscope. There is so much life in that, that compost, uh, the, the castings, and that's why we use that to make the compost tea. You can also use compost soil, but we'll get into that. So just a little bit of where I'm coming from, and does anyone have any pressing issues that you want to make sure I cover. Yes? You need to use the microphone. I'm hard of hearing. I'm sorry. Maybe you can take that off. Right? I could hold it. If you just stand behind it, it catches up. Oh, okay. Oh, it's really good. Oh, okay. oh, it's really good. Yeah. All right, so I will just stand here and not move from now on. Can you hear me now? Yes. That's good. Okay, that's probably the most important thing that you can actually hear what's going on. All right, are we ready? Any other quick starter questions? All right, let's do this. Okay, um, did I mention life in the soil? Let's start there. Oh, I have this special thing, and I'm supposed to go like. <laughs> okay, um, so basically, I like this slide because it really shows you a cross section of what's going on, most of which we don't see. Um, all, nat all plants in nature and in a healthy environment have this symbiotic relationship, which we're going to talk about, between the life in the soil and the plants. Um, does anyone know about the Bionutrient Food Association? They're heavily involved in soil life and also trying to prove how much soil life contributes to nutritious food. So um, if you want to look at any of their talks or, or get more involved, they have chapters in, in most states around the Northeast. It's bionutrient.org. So this is when I do the silly thing, just so you remember this, okay? I am a plant and I'm taking in the sunlight, I'm converting that through photosynthesis and I'm producing exudates. You know, I don't hang on to those exudates. 50 to 70% of what I take in, I give out in the soil to feed the microbes. In exchange, those microbes get whatever nutrients are available and feed that back to the plant. That's that symbiotic relationship, which is so key. I ta taught under Dr. Elaine Ingham, and uh, she calls these exudates or sugars, she calls them cakes and cookies, which I thought was pretty funny. So she has a diagram with cakes and cookies coming out of the roots. Uh, and and this, this whole thing, symbiotic relationship, helps to protect the root system, um, enhances the nutrient cycling that we're gonna talk about, and it also builds soil structure, which we're gonna actually see by looking through a microscope. So 
this is the soil food web. And if you are interested in, in learning more about the soil food web, you can just type in soil food web. And you'll probably learn about this course that Dr. Elaine Ingham ta teaches. And it's about this, what is going on in the soil. We have an animal kingdom above the ground, and below we have this entire food system of, of different organisms. So you have your lower ones, your fungi and bacteria, second trophic level. You go up to the third trophic level, they're consuming, and they're the predators here. So the smaller ones are protozoa, like flagellates and amoeba. And then you have go up again, you have the amoeba, the, sorry, the nematodes and the microarthropods. You're gonna see them all under the microscope. So that's what's going on. If someone says the soil food web, this is what they're talking about. And this quote, which Gabe Brown is saying here, but I've heard many people talk about that there are more organisms in, in this case, teaspoon of healthy soil than there are people on Earth. So what does that look like? Remember I talked about bacteria fungi? This is that balance. If you have, like you've just disturbed the soil, you've turned it over, and now it's bacterial dominant. Guess what? It's mother's nature of, uh, way of covering itself you are selecting for weeds at the bottom. So 100% bacterial, bare soil, guess what? Weeds are gonna come up. That's mother nature's way of preparing the soil to cover it with the easiest method. You go into an old growth forest, you're going to see 100% fungal. The plants we wanna grow are somewhere in the middle. So you might hear me on a couple of these videos going, oh, that fungus is so beautiful. <laughs> not being a scientist, because it really is. And it also means that you have a nice balance of bacteria, fungi, so that you aren't just going to have the weeds take over. You're going to be able to grow the plants that we want to grow. Now, if you're growing brassicas and things like that, annuals, they can handle a more bacterial dominant soil. But as you're going towards more perennials, in this case, um, strawberries or shrubs, more into the tree canopy, you, your soil really wants to be more fungal. All right, so we're gonna take a quick look at healthy soil under the microscope. Healthy living soil is filled with a balance of fungi, bacteria, protozoa, nematodes, and microarthropods. The USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service defines soil as a living and life-giving natural resource. Traditional soil testing dating back 100 years has informed nutrient management based solely on chemical analysis. Scientists and land care specialists are developing more encompassing ways to study soil that includes the physical and biological nature of soil as well as its chemical composition. By studying all three aspects of their soil, land managers can make decisions and implement strategies that take into account a more robust approach to soil health. An incredible diversity of organisms make up the soil food web. From the tiniest one-cell bacteria, algae, fungi, and protozoa, to the more complex nematodes and microarthropods, to the visible earthworms, insects, and plants. We're going to zoom in 100 to 400 times magnification to check out these critters living in our soil and get a close-up look at what healthy soil looks like. First, let's take a look at bacteria. The smallest, most plentiful microbes, bacteria benefit plants by increasing nutrient availability, including nitrogen. Chemical fertilizers and pesticides limit bacterial numbers, stopping aggregates from being formed, leaving no structure in the soil. Tilling leads to bacterial dominant soil, thereby selecting for weeds. Soil that's left undisturbed has a nice balance of bacteria and fungi, with plentiful aggregates, organic matter, and soil structure. Fungi grow in long, thread-like strands or hyphae in the soil. Reduced tillage allows fungi to flourish, so they can help plants stay up water and nutrients, resist disease, and tolerate drought. A fungal dominant soil is usually found in woodlands and around mature trees. Incorporating fungal dominant soil in your compost or compost tea can help inoculate soils 
leading to a balanced fungi bacteria ratio, selected for crops we want to grow. Protozoa are single cell predators, which include flagellates, amoeba, and ciliates. They feed on bacteria, fungi, other protozoa, and organic matter, releasing plant available nutrients. Protozoa are responsible for mineralizing nitrogen in agricultural soils. They are also a good source of food for other soil organisms and help prevent certain pathogens from establishing on plants. Like protozoa, nematodes are important in releasing nutrients in plant available form. They help distribute bacteria and fungi through the soil by carrying microbes on their surfaces and in their digestive systems. They are useful indicators of soil quality, since nematode populations are impacted by all land management practices. They enhance soil quality by regulating the populations of other soil organisms and consuming disease-causing organisms. Microarthropods. They are fundamental to the creation of humus and the formation of soil. They contribute to a healthy soil ecology especially helping with the decomposition of soil organic matter into a form that bacteria can consume. They contribute to nutrient cycling in the soil and also help suppress plant pests. They actually increase nitrogen in soil by digesting microbes and organic matter. The most important work we can do as stewards of the land is to help bring soil back to life. So. Um, I, I just wanted to show you what is going on down there where the, the soil microbes are in charge. <laughs> so that gives you an idea. And that's what we really want to work on. Uh, the reason we make the compost tea is so th those microbes can multiply and feed on nutrients that are now plant available. And that's what we feed our plants. So how do we do that? Now we're going to talk about compost tea. So what that is, it's um, the result of aerobic, so lots of oxygen, uh, aerobically brewing compost in water with added amendments, and that gives you this nutritious food source for your plants. That's the definition. Um, this is Dr. Ingham demonstrating the difference between an extract and compost tea. So say you're, you've got this amazing worm castings that you created or the best compost that you know has got some great fungal in there, and you don't have a compost tea brewer. What you can do is take that compost, put it in non-chlorinated water. Very important because guess what's gonna happen if you use chlorinated water, right? Um, so you take that, you add it to, in, and in this case we use, the magic word is 400 micron. A 400 micron mesh bag. You can actually, you know those paint strainers that you put on top of five gallon bucks? That's 400 microns. So that works. Um, but in this case, we're using a bag. So you, you can put them in there. And then you just sort of massage it. That 400 micron is the perfect size for the microbes to be released into the liquid while holding all of the other organic matter and elements in there. So it's a great way to release it. Um, in this case, she's massaging it. It goes into the liquid. And then she's using it right away. She's not adding amendments, she's not aerating it. So what you've done is you've made it now, all those microbes are available in this liquid form, and you take that and apply it to your plants. So that's an extract. This on the other hand is a tea. And this is how we started with our five gallon bucket, the aquarium bubbler. <laughs> okay, don't make this mistake. The first time I did it, I was putting in ponds and things like that. So I took my aquarium bubbler and I put it in the water and I'm reading the instructions. Do, if this gets wet, and I went, wet gets wet, what? <laughs> so don't put it in the water. Okay, so these te specific aquarium pumps are outside and blow the air into the, the, um, the liquid. And it's as easy as we would hold down our, our tubes with a rock and we would use either a cheesecloth, in this case they're using a nylon stocking, put it in there, and there you go. You've got your oxygen, you've got your castings being released, and, and then you have your, your compost tea. So this is, you're using aeration, usually 24 hours is what you want to use. 
Uh, you're adding your compost and your amendments. We're going to talk about what amendments. And then um, you, what happens is that those microbes are now released. They've got oxygen, and they've got some great food sources, what you put in there. And then they multiply by the billions in 24 hours. And they've all consumed these nutrients that are now plant available. You apply that as a foliar spray or a root drench. Those nutrients are plant available and immediately taken up by the plant. So we'll talk about that. Um, one thing I did want to mention, you see those air stones there? I would not recommend that because they get clogged and they get the, what we call biofilm on there. So just a straight um, tube with the air blowing through is all you really need. Any questions about this setup? You certainly can. Can I say anything else about it? They're not talking about what amendments here. That's the only thing. I, I'll give you some recipes uh, a little later. One for a five gallon bucket and one for a 50 gallon brewer. All right, so what are the benefits? Why go to all this trouble even though I just told you? Uh, well, here are some specifics about what potential benefits that, that scientists have come up with. You get water retention in soil, so you re reduce water usage by up to 70%, and then you also, um, the plants take up those ne needed nutrients, um, and then they get stronger and are resist infection. Um, the rooting depth they find are deeper for plants that have the, the, the compost tea applications. And then uh, it also, because you have all these microbes in there, they are decomposing the materials and, the, and also any toxins, so, taking those out of the soil. So um, that's something that we don't talk about a lot, but is also really fundamental for compost tea brewing. Um, and then you don't need the chemicals. You don't need the fertilizer that's going to kill one application of chemical fertilizer kills half the life in the soil. And then guess what? Your plant doesn't have that, that symbiotic relationship anymore with the microbes. And so they become weak and dependent on herbicides, fungicides, um, and pesticides. So it's a vicious cycle, which we don't want to go into. So the less you disturb your soil, avoiding chemical fertilizers will make sure that your, your microbes have a better chance. Yes? Can you use rainwater? Rainwater, yes. Totally. And if you do use chlorinated water, uh, just let it sit in the, in the thing for 24 hours. Better to even let it aerate for, for uh, overnight so most of that chlorine dissipates. That's what we do at the, the organic nursery that brews compost tea every week. And I've checked it, and that works fine. Um, so how do you make it? All right, so <laughs> this is how I started. This is the uh, reservoir community farm. It used to be a strip mall. And then it sat empty for 25 years. And the, the city said, here you go. <laughs> so we took it on. It was a, a, an acre and a half, uh, 1.7 acres. We built 132 by 4 foot raised beds. We filled it with soil. Now what? No money left for fertilizer. I was just learning about compost tea at the time. This is 12 years ago. And so we, I said, well, I have worm castings in my dining room. Uh, <laughs> that's another story. OK. And we had this garbage can, and I started reading about compost tea. So we brewed it, a 50-gallon brew, with all sorts of aeration in there, so it bubbled away. And then that's what we used. Little did we realize we were inoculating that dead soil with all of these microbes. And then when we planted, we would do this every two weeks. Every, when we planted, of course, now those microbes had a home, and they formed that symbiotic relationship with the plants. Amazing the difference. I can still remember going down, a, going down a row of peppers and noticing by the end of the row that the ones at the beginning were like standing up straighter, were lush green, immediate. As a foliar spray, the plant it gets taken in immediately. I've done some test trials that I'll show you. How are we doing for time, by the way, do we know? I'll give you a five minute warning of that. Oh, that might, might be oh, yeah. too late. So, Am I going too fast, too slow? You have till 3.15 to talk. OK, and what time is it? It's uh, 2.36. Oh, we got this. OK. <laughs> All right, so anyway, that's that. That's how I learned it. Um, this is how you do it. You add your amendments, um, food for bacteria, food for fungi, to, did I mention, non-chlorinated water. So this is the formula after, how long have I done this, 10 years? We're using, I guess it's 12, because <laughs> that's when I started learning it. But 
religiously every 10 years. So you've got your fish hydrolysate, your kelp, and your humic acid. We used to do um, molasses. And what we found, especially looking under the microscope, is that was bacterial food only. In fact, the bacteri bacterial food liked it so much, they multiplied so quickly, they often used up the oxygen and ended up being anaerobic. So we no longer, and Dr. Ingham is on this um, as well, we no longer use molasses or sugar-based um, amendments. So the, the um, kelp is food for bacteria and fungi, and the fish hydrolysate is really good food for the, the, the fungi only. Um, I say hydrolysate, not emulsion. So the reason you don't want to use emulsion is it's done with a heating process, so a lot of nutrients are gone, and they remove all the oil and sell that separately. Hydrolysate, cold process, everything stays in there, including the oils, which are cut key. So that's why if you are buying any type of fish, that's the one you want to do. All right, so you're adding these amendments, you're brewing it for 24 hours. Did I mention you should test it under the microscope? We ended up writing the regs so we could have certified organic compost tea. And one of the regs we put in there was to look at the tea once every four brews, which involves taking a drop and sticking it under a microscope and looking at it. That's it. And you make sure that you have the life there for various reasons, which I'll tell you about. Um, and then you can do it anytime. I find the best time to put down compost tea is at when the, the plants need it the most. They're going through a growth spurt. They're about to flower. They're about to produce fruit. They're hanging on at the end of the season. All of those times are really the best times to use compost tea. Oh, this is a little video. I cut it as short as I could. If you're doing this at home, this is a seven gallon brewer. And I'll just show you quickly how I, how I brew it. All right, I just start the video, okay. So I have a little pond, a recirculating pond. So I'll just use that water because it's non-chlorinated and uh, fill up the brewer. You can see the pump, the, the pump is there and the hose is going underneath so that the oxygen is coming from underneath. And what's nice about the funnel shape is that there's nowhere for an those anaerobic microbes to hide. So it bubbles from underneath and fills. So here I, I put the amendments in there. I'm turning it on. So it's bubbling away. I let it bubble for a little while so everything mixes. The humic acid will help kill uh, or deal with the, the uh, chlorine. So that's something to think about too. Now I'm lowering, in this case, worm castings, but you can add any compost that you think is great. So that's in there. Then I put my hand in there and massage it so that it, it loosens up and the microbes can easily get out into the, uh, into the food source. And then I wait 24 hours. I thought I cut it so short. Really? <laughs> Come on, that's a good, oh, okay, so what happens next, weird, is um, 24 hours later, I take out the bag and I just open the hose and put it into a, a, a five gallon bucket or into, in my case, I, I use a backpack sprayer. I fill that up, put it on my back and spray. Do it as a foliar spray and as a root drench. Oh, did I miss this? Um, so again, you can use uh, worm castings. Um, these are the regs that we wrote in um, to, to get certified organic. So uh, we use vegetative inputs only. And one of the reasons for that is if you're, um, f anything that you're making into a tea, if you want to use it as foliar spray, you don't necessarily want to put any manures in there. So vegetative inputs only is what we, what we talked about. Um, non-chlorinated water we discussed. And then these are the organic amendments that I use that are all certified for organic growing that are listed there. You can also use fish bone meal, alfalfa meal, um, and did I mention about molasses? Here's a list of, of other ingredients you can add. Um, I would stay away personally from the ones that are just bacterial um, food, um, even though um, organic unfiltered unsulfured molasses is good for both, I still would stay away from extra sugars. You just don't need it in a tea. Okay, everyone take a picture of that. 
Um, all right, here's how I do it. So we're going to make some compost tea. This brew is going to be for the berries. All right, so let's make our solution. The first thing it calls for is a cup of liquid chocolate. And a good way to remember the ratio between kelp and fish is one fourth. So if that was a cup of kelp, this will be a quarter cup of the fish. <laughs> so when I use the unit acid, it's really as a little bit of an extra shot. The worm castings themselves have a lot of unit acid in them, and you can tell by how dark it is, cocoa color. And this will be good to add to the 50 gallons of water that are bubbling away at the berries. Hi, good morning. My name is Joe Barry. I'm here at Gilberti's Earth Gardens, and we are brewing compost tea, as we do every Saturday. And the first thing we're doing is we're putting it on our cloud safe. And that's where the magic begins. We put this in, we let it go a little bit, and then we add, of course, the worm castings to this brew, and tomorrow, voila! Compost worm tea, which is the best thing for all your plants. And so there you have it. We have our fish hydrolysate, kelp, humic acid, followed by our worm castings in a bag. On Friday, we're going to be brewing all day. Come first thing Saturday morning, you can use the product on all your plants, both vegetables, flowers, house plants, shrubs, anything you want. And then the magic begins. Yeah, hi, I'm Emma. I also work with Gilberts. Um, I'm a big fan of compost tea because it's a really good way to be in harmony with nature. Because once you're working with nature instead of against it about chemical products, then I don't know, it just works out better, yeah? You know? so. Now we're going to travel 100 miles north to Egremont, Massachusetts, in the Berkshires. This is April Hill run by Green Acres, a nonprofit working with young people doing green jobs. That's just in Torco in the field in March, and here we are a few months later. Look at the development and the gardens that have been created, planted, and are now maintained by young people. And what are they using for fertilizer? Compost tea. Okay, so I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop it there because I, I do. It's a bit repetitive in terms of how you make the tea. You all know you're all experts now, so I don't need to to, <laughs> to share that part. Because um, I thought we would go on and talk about um, how to get those the organisms that have a high fungal content. Um, so you can use fungal dominant soil. Yes. Is there a basic ratio of you know per gallon? Yeah, I have a, a recipe coming up. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because otherwise, how would you know? <laughs> right? And do, am I encouraging you all to get a microscope so you can look at it, right? How much fungi is in there? How are you going to know unless you can see it? Um, but what we're talking about here, there are different ways that, that I'll add um, if I know I'm going to be pl putting it on my fruit trees or, or strawberries or something that would definitely like more fungal, um, I, I try to find soil that's more fungal. So I don't know if anyone knows um, Twombly, Kevin Tw Ken Twombly. He has Twombly Nurseries for years and years. He showed up at my doorstep with a bag of uh, soil he got from healthy mountain laurels that he found in the state park. Mountain laurels being our state plant. And I'm looking around at my really sad looking mountain laurels going, oh, that's really helpful. Let's make a tea with it. So we did. And I sprayed it on my mountain laurels. That was three years ago. Amazing. Amazing. So what we're doing is taking that really amazing, and I've got actually pictures of it, uh, at that amazing fungal, who knows? We still don't know what is it in there, but we're applying that to the same type of species that has the same types of problems, and that's what goes on. So I, I actually do want to show you also how it eats powdery mildew. 
Um, so we'll talk about that. Oh, it's not going to play that video. Um, okay, so, so yes. So could you just elaborate on that a little bit? So you have Mountain Laurel do you dig around the plant to yeah, get he, the UDC material. He just got a bag of the of the soil that was around the really healthy mountain laurels. And what we did at Greenagers, they were planting all these sapling trees, a lot of cherries, and they had one really mature cherry tree. We did the same thing. We got the soil from around that mature cherry tree, and we inoculated all of those saplings with the tea made from the soil from around that healthy, mature cherry tree. And they're doing great. So it, we're just, I feel like we're just pioneers in this, and that I feel very strongly that this is the solution. All right, preaching, sorry. Um, another cool way to, to add um, fungal is to take some worm castings and add some steel cut oats. And they'll slowly decompose and, and create a lot of fungi in there. And in fact, here it's what it looks like under the microscope. We are at Fort Detroit's identification. This is a sample of worm castings with steel cut oats added for indigenous microbes. We are looking at four uh, nematodes, all in the same frame, lots of fungal life, lots of bacteria. In the same sample, we are at 100 times that magnification. That's actually 400. Uh, looking at a diverse section of fungal hyphae. All right, so uh, we're convinced. Um, did I mention bio, biofilm? So if you are making any tea, whether it's in a five gallon bucket or a 50 gallon brewer or anything in between, you really wanna make sure, because what happens, you'll empty it and then you get this film around it and it'll dry. And then the next time you make tea, all those anaerobic microbes that have hidden out in the film are going to multiply. So you really wanna remove any of this biofilm that you see. And you do that, we used to use hydrogen peroxide. We don't use anything anymore, except as soon as you empty your bucket or your brewer, you rinse it with a, um, a jet stream hose and, and maybe a little uh, scrub brush and just scrub it off and, and use that pressure. Cause it's wet, it comes off really easily. And then you do that with the pipes as well. Clean out the pipes with a little pipe cleaner. That's one of the key things you can do to be able to brew every time and knowing you're, 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 you've got a clean system. And I remember once um, I go to Gilberti's every four weeks to check because they, they brew every week. They, today was their first day brewing of the season. That's a good sign. Um, so I'd go there every four weeks. And once I took a look and said, there's no life in here. And he said, that makes no sense. We washed it so thoroughly with hydrogen peroxide. I said, well, did you rinse it? I don't know, I have to ask, I guess not, no. So <laughs> it's, yeah, it's one of those things that's why we stop using that, but we also make sure as soon as we empty it, that we clean it out. Did I mention biofilm? That's one of the things. Okay. Okay, uh, repeating myself there. And that's why also whatever you use, try cleaning out the one on the right. How, how many hours is that gonna take? Cleaning out all of those tubes. So the simpler the design, the better. So this has just got one pipe going up uh, and, and, and that's all you need to clean. Um, and so you brew it aerobically. I don't know if anyone, if they're doing it, if they want to notice that uh, you want to maintain a minimum power of 1.35 watts per gallon. That's the, the key there. Um, and then you aerobically brew it for 24 hours, and then you test it under the microscope. That's our, our crew there. Um, and then, you, as I mentioned, my, check it every four or five brews, or if anything changes, you're changing the inputs, uh, you're changing the, the soil or, or the, the compost that you're putting in there. And as I mentioned, all about aeration, keeping that oxygen going. All right, so what happens if you don't? And I'm guilty of this, at, at first I didn't realize how important it was. You've got all, the, all these aerobic microbes that, guess what, like us, need oxygen. Now if you take that and uh, let it sit in the sun for a little bit, guess what's gonna happen? Well, we'll take a look. So this is compost tea, a time magnification, 20 hours after brew. 
Look how full that is. We have, I would say, dozens in this one drop. Plenty of diverse bacteria, lots of aggregates full of bacteria. I'm also uh, seeing flagellates. And I'm watching these nematodes uh, come back to life now that they stopped bouncing around in a brewer. So this is 100 times magnification. Some compost tea. Oh my, he's fast. Probably this insect water guy who's enjoying the anaerobic conditions, as you can see, next to what appears to be a, a very dormant nematode. Compost tea that I left in the jar for 12 hours. A lot of silly is going on. This silly is actually creeping off a dead microbial body. You can see that the bacteria flying around that he's drawing out of that. I kind of grows much more. So these run around sparse bacteria because the ciliates have been eating it. Doesn't smell that bad, but it's going there. So definitely going that road. We're looking at ordered times magnification. This is what appears to be a type of cilia, the porticella, sucking up what remains of the bacteria in the compost tea. A day and a half after brew, you can see it's very bare. And so the anaerobic microbes have consumed all of the beneficial uh, bacteria. I have a sad story, but does tell the tale that you cannot save compost tea. And just so you know, this is now 200 times. Okay, that's enough. That's so depressing. <laughs> Okay, um, but it does show you also, and, and the reason I, I like including that, even though who's going to let its, their compost tea sit there for that long, especially now, now that we see those, the fate of the microarthropods. Um, but what it does tell you is if you have anaerobic conditions, so say you have really wet soil, really wet compost, these are the anaerobic microbes that are going to take over and consume the bacteria, and they're fast, and they're just going to, to have a party. And so that's why we want to keep our soil light, make sure that it doesn't become compacted and have anaerobic conditions like this compost tea. Um, so the other thing um, we want to talk about is the cleaning, that biofilm again, and then not to use the water stones, which I already talked about. Um, you can dilute, but what's wrong with this picture? Right. Sometimes you just think, oh, just add some water. Just keep in mind, these are living aerobic microbes that would be killed with the chlorine. Um, there should never be a bad smell. There should be no smell at all. So if you do have a bad smell, it means it's going anaerobic. And here's that recipe, if you, if you want to take a picture of that. So that shows you for the five gallon brewer, or <laughs> I call it a brewer, you might call it a bucket. Um, and then if you're doing it at a, at a 50 gallon scale. And that seems to be, after 10 years, I, I just keep coming back to this and that seems to be giving me the best results. Also with those ingredients. It used to be very complicated, but I'm finding this is, this is really all you need. Yes? Would that still be two cups of regular compost if you don't have access to warm Yes, I would, I would do that. Or you can say a cup of compost and a cup of indigenous soil where you're going to take those indigenous microbes and multiply those. Yes? Could I get like kelp from the beach? Um, you could. There, there will be salt content. Okay. And salt is good how much? So it's, it varies. Uh, so I would tend to, I would want to rinse it. Okay. But why wouldn't you just add that to the compost? It would be great. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be great if you could look at it under the microscope? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, yes? Pardon? Sorry, does it matter if you use liquid kelp or kelp meal? Um, you can use either. I find liquid kelp easier and easier to measure, but I have in the past used kelp meal and added water and then, so you mix it first and then add it to your uh, solution. Yes, sorry. Can you use a commercial bag of um, worm compost or worm castings? Um, or you could. I've looked at those under the microscope. If they're in sealed bags, guess what? They're not aerobic microbes in there. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, if you have, if they're aerated bags, or we use um, breathable bags so that it allows oxygen exchange but keeps um, the moisture in there. 
so there are different ways to get around that. But generally, when I, I will go to a store and buy what's off the can, the, the comp, that's why you all have to start doing uh, worm composting. Oh, that's the next class. Yeah, that's really the answer. Yes? Um, with, with the rotted stump of a tree, you know, practically soil, would that be fungal material? It would. I would love to see that. Could you do that and, and send a? Sure. OK, yeah. Tell us about the results next year. OK. okay. Yoko. I have asked you this before, but do you see any issues with running the compost tea through um, sprinklers? It's just going to clog. That's my biggest concern. If you really have a, um, a good strainer yeah. before it goes into the, um, the irrigation tubes, but I know people have tried it and gotten really frustrated. But sprinklers, right? Oh, sprinklers, then you have more pressure. I ju I, I've not tried that. No. But you're talking about drip tape in terms of the clogging? Yeah, yeah, that's been clog clogging, so. Yes? I would go with alfalfa, alfalfa meal, um, and that other uh, the list had a few other ones on there. Did yeah, yeah, and in, in that case, because the fish was really feeding the fungal, you want to get something that'll feed the fungal. And if we have time, I'll go back to that slide. All right, any other questions? Cool. All right, so we got the formula. Here we are at the hickories brewing compost tea. They um, put it in this. Um, what do you call it? Plastic carrying container. <laughs> I know there's a scientific name for that. Um, and they, they go around the, the farm and spray with it. And there's a note here. Um, you want to use uh, larger plumbing so it's easier to clean. And then the diaphragm pumps and agitation. So it stays agitated. So all the sediment doesn't go down and go into what's being fed to the, to the garden. Um, they've done this, and this is their uh, a reg regimen um, of just using compost tea on all of their plants. And they were one of the few in that area um, of Connecticut this past year that had tomatoes that didn't get blight. And this is one of the reasons. And in fact, I want to get to that slide uh, where I show you what happened with the powdery mildew. Yes? Oh, just uh, one question. For the, uh, the tea bag for the compost the tea right. itself, what were you using for fabric? Can you use those like old pantyhose? Or yeah, you socks? could. It's just you don't know if it's exactly 400 micron. If you want, if you know you want to get into this, it's worth the $10 investment to buy a 400 micron mesh bag. Where did I buy that? Yeah. Amazon? Paint store. <laughs> Where? Paint store. A paint store. Although that, that will give you one that fits on top of a five gallon bucket. But if you want one that goes inside your brewer, um, then we use bags. We'll, we'll take a bag of, that you can buy that is made for brewing compost tea. And then you just put it in there. Make sure you rinse it out with the jets very carefully afterwards so that all that biofilm is off. And we use it for five, 10 years, five, no, five or six years per bag. So it's a good investment. So, all right, so, um, oh yeah, I was talking about, oh, I, interesting, we're not going to look at that, but um, they brew weekly, and they sell these containers, 10-gallon containers, uh, for $10. So it's an amazing business to get in, and the cool thing about it is it has to be local. So every town, every neighborhood needs someone brewing compost tea, so it doesn't have to travel far. and. So that's all your mission, to start a business doing compost tea brewing in your front yard, or whatever you want to do. But uh, they, they put it, whatever they have left over, they put it on all their plants. Yes? Are you saying that they sell that? Yes, they do. How do they keep it from going anaerobic? It's bubbling. And they've been doing it seven years. You come bring your own container, or they fill it to order. Exactly. And everybody now knows the drill because it's told to them and they've read it and they've and it's year six and they sell out every weekend so it's uh, they're really excited about it and they've seen what a huge difference it makes on their plants that they're selling so and what's nice because it's vegetative inputs only you can then um, apply it right up to the day of harvest and not have any concerns as a foliar spray all right so we're skipping that oh. Um, and moving on to how to apply it. Now that you've made this tea, 
what do you do? Now, foliar spraying is one of the most effective ways because the bacteria, for example, is sticky. It's going to stick to the leaves and immediately feed that plant. So um, it, you can get about, these are some rules, 70% of the leaf covered with the tea on both sides of the leaves. Um, don't do it when, if it's raining hard. Um, or if the sun is blazing because that's kind of defeating the purpose. I find the best time of day to put down the tea is late afternoon. Where the heat of the sun is gone, you, you, you apply the tea, it sits for a while, and then the dew in the summer will keep it there. And then if you know there's a rain later, even better, because then it gets washed in. So there's all these, these ways to apply it. You can apply it really early in the morning, 8 a.m., not so good because it's, it's, it's on the leaves now and it's going, especially in the middle of summer, it's going to evaporate really quickly. So just keep that in mind. It's on these leaves. How is it going to stay there and be the most effective? Stay there as in slowly get absorbed, not forever, <laughs> obviously. Um, so you also want to do it when the plants are active. So um, two weeks before bud break and uh, right through that fancy word, senescence of all plants. Um, and it should be applied so the liquid remains on the leaf, the stem, the flowers, and it doesn't drip off. So the larger the drop size, the more likely it'll run off. So when you're, con when you're controlling the, the, the speed of the spray, um, try to keep it pretty clo closed so that it's a, a, a softer spray rather than large drops that are just falling to the ground. Although the other thing you'll do is a, a root drench, but we'll talk about that next. Okay, so here you go, you, you apply it to dimension as soon as possible. And then um, you spray all the stems and the leaves. And then you can put it, and then I'll just put it in a, a because I have a small garden, I'll put it in a, a, a watering can and go around the roots of the plant. So then it goes down right around the roots and, and again, plant available nutrients and microbes that are going to have a party down there. So here's an example of a tree that we uh, have at the farm in, in Bridgeport. And I just, I should have done them all, but we were just experimenting at the time. So I sprayed this one tree every three weeks and it just was laden with apples. So it helps with botrytis, it helps with rust and, and so many other things. Um, so you can use it on vegetables, flowers, and trees. Okay, here's a few examples of how it works. Um, here's some, some documents, um, the research. Um, so it talks about plant roots um, being having nutrients an hour immediately after application. So it's used right away. Um, and then it's put on, uh, to, on the, those, that foliage to provide the cell tissues with those nutrients. Um, so you, again, here's the difference in terms of root development when, when tea has been applied. And here's a, a test I did last year at the college. Um, so I started seeing powdery mildew. I quickly made a tea, uh, and then I just wanted to take a photo of the same plant 10 minutes after applying the tea. So it um, blew my mind. So uh, again, those microbes, the bacteria are sticking to the leaf, they're eating the powdery mildew, and then it, the new growth comes out clean. So that one application, this is three days later, that same plant, and now four days later, and then uh, 10 days later, and the, we had no powdery mildew. And this was August. Oh, now we're in September. So it was very humid, and, and you would think, that we would, had we not sprayed the tea, we know it would happen. And the, the, oh, and here we are 13 days later. Amazing crop at that time of year. Um, looking for the time. What time? 3.15 we're ending? Yes. Nine more minutes. Nine more minutes. All right, another quick example of a test trial. Yes? So you were discussing how the foliar spray really works. Could you also recommend some kinds as well? And I guess what I'm wondering is how you would Well, those um, bacteria are also full of these plant available nutrients that they've been consuming in the tea. And so those are immediately taken in by the plant through the cells of, of, of the leaves. So that's why when I did that row of peppers, I could see the difference. So here's an example where 
I did a quick example of using worm castings and compost tea on two different fields next to each other. This is at um, the farm. And what was interesting, the control side that I chose had much, high, when I did a quick chemical analysis, had much higher nutrients than the one I was going to add the, tea, the, the compost tea to, which I thought was good because, you know, better to be behind, right, in this kind of situation. Uh, so what I do all the time is I'll add 10% of worm castings to my seed starting mix, same seed starting mix, and then I'll put a, a, a cup in each transplant hole, or half a cup if it's a smaller plant. And then I do this recipe. On the control side, I added all of those same amendments. I just didn't make a tea. But I put it in the sprayer, I did a foliar spray and a root dredge, exactly the same protocol. In the other one, I made a tea. And so what happens after I spray it every three weeks? Well, this is what happened when I harvested. So you can see a difference in the quality and the amount. And this, I'm just going to flip through these. All right, so this is April 8th and 12th. Oh, sorry, did I say April? I meant August. And now we're looking. I harvested them, and then I was going to make sauce, but I didn't get around to it right away. The one on the left got really diseased quickly and bruised, and the skin was much, and it wasn't as sweet compared to the one that had the compost tea. So I thought that was interesting. Look at the difference in the quality of these vegetables. And again, how quickly the one on the left was bruising and, and diseased. Look at the yield difference. So now it was going to frost. So I grabbed whatever I could, and there, again, you, a lot more in the, in the compost tea side. And then I finally got around to making tea. Plus, I wanted to see how long the ones on the right lasted. 15 days later, I could use every tomato from the one that had the compost tea spray. I didn't expect it to have that kind of effect on the quality of the fruit. I was just blown away. And in conclusion, it's, oops, <laughs> that's fast. In conclusion, all life depends. I wanted that guy to go. OK, maybe if I do this. There we go. In conclusion, essentially, all life depends on soil. There can be no soil without, no life without soil, and no soil without life. They have evolved together. And I think the more we can work with that and encourage the life in the soil, and this is one of the ways I found the most accessible way to do that. So that was my passionate speech. <laughs> Thanks.